Hello. So far you've experienced linear regression and multiple regression, both of which have continuous variables as the explanatory variables. So there was the healthcare um, spending and child mortality example. Healthcare was the explanatory variable and it was continuous. It was numbers that vary continuously. That's in great con contrast to what are called categorical or sometimes factor type explanatory variables. Categories might be species. That's the case in the data set that we're going to look at during this, um, these few videos. Um, so categorical explanatory variables. Um, the other things that we're going to cover in these videos are the usual workflow for uh, solving quantitative problems in R. Uh, we're going to have a look at those different types of variables. Um, we're going to look at transforming a variable um, to prevent a problem from happening, uh, one of the problems that Steffi talked about in the, the lecture. And um, as I said, we're going to look at linear models with a categorical explanatory variable, and actually linear models with both categorical and continuous explanatory variables. So we're going to qu cover quite a lot of ground on linear models during these uh, series of video lectures. Mm -hmm. um, as usual, also we'll talk about degrees of freedom and interpreting the summary table of the linear models. That's very important, so we'll go over that in some detail. And we'll be making graphs and um, making nice graphs and trying to communicate the results. Um, so we need a data set to work with. We need a quantitative problem to work with. And what better quantitative problem than badgers and earthworms and poo? Okay, so um, apparently badgers eat quite a lot of earthworms and it would be quite nice to be able to say exactly what weight or approximately what weight of earthworms are consumed by the badgers. Um, and obviously it's not possible to weigh the earthworms before the badgers eat them. Um, that would be quite tricky, I can't think of how one would do that. Um, but it turns out that in the badger's poo um, is a little part of the earthworm's gut that's not digested by the badger. So one can get these little bits out of the badger poo and perhaps the size of these is a good indicator of the weight of the individual earthworm that it came from. So that's a question that we are going to address with the data set and it's actually someone addressed. What they did was they went out and collected a bunch of earthworms, uh, live whole earthworms, they weighed them and then they dissected them out, dissected this, this little part of the gut out and um, measured it. So they got a data set of the, the weight of the earthworm, the size of this little part, and they did that for three different genera of, um, of earthworms. Um, and actually we'd like to know if, if there's a relationship between the size of this little part and the weight of the earthworm. That'd be great because we could use it to then use the the little parts, the size that come from the poo, to predict the total weight of um, earthworms eaten. Um, we need to know if that relationship differs from di between different species of earthworm, though. Um, if it does, then when we get that little part out of the badger poo, we will also need to know what species it came from, not just its size. And obviously, that, that could be quite difficult. I actually don't know if it's possible. It could be quite difficult, though, one could imagine. So it's important to know whether the relationship between the size of this part and the weight of the earthworm depends on which species of earthworm it is. OK, so that's the, um, that's the question uh, that we're interested in. Let's go to R. And, um, and have a look at the um, data set and um, do the preliminaries. Okay, so I'm going to open a new script file and at the top rm list equals ls and run that so we've cleared ours memory. Load in some libraries. We'll do the tidyverse as usual and we'll do gg fortify to get the um, diagnostic plots easily. Next, we need to import, well, let's save, let's save this right at the start now, in the desktop, my earthworm analysis, save it. Now we need to import the data set. So let's go here, it's a CSV file on my desktop. I put it there but conveniently. Here it is, earthworm CSV. I'm going to again call the object DD as it comes in. Uh, here are the columns. It looks pretty good. It looks like it's going to be imported properly. Oops. 
So I'll just grab this part. I'm not actually going to use this to import it. I'm going to copy the code there like I know I should. Let's import that data set. Oops, I didn't run these. Uh, I have to run those. You see, I got an error here, which is could not find function read underscore CSV. Um, that's because I hadn't run library tinyverse. So there I ran it, and one of the packages it loads is read R, and that's where this function resides. So now that I've run that, we get the data set imported. It says passed with column specifications. Uh, Gattung is a character, number is an integer, gewicht is a double, that means it's a continuous explanatory variable, a numeric variable. Uh, the data it was captured on is a character, and the circumference of the gut is a double as well, that means it's a numeric continuous variable. We can have a look at the data set here, and we've got um, Gattung, the genera, that's OC. Uh, there's some L, there's an L, and there's N. <clears throat> this number is some kind of identifier of the individual that was caught. Here's its weight, here's the date it was caught on, and here's the circumference. Perfect. So you can see this uh, Magenlumpf is a continuous explanatory variable. It's numeric and it varies continuously. This gewicht is a continuous explanatory, uh, sorry, this is a continuous variable as well. This is going to be our response variable. And here, Gattung is a, um, uh, it's not continuous, it's not numbers, it's categories actually. So there are three categories. One is OC, one is L, and the other is N, and that's the genera. Okay, so that's the data. Perfect. The next thing um, that we want to do, as always, is have a look at that data, have, uh, try and understand that data. Um, and if we deal with the categorical variable first, one thing we might want to know is the number of uh, observations um, in each of those categories. And we can do that with a function called table, um, dd dollar gattung. Um, so we're using the dollar sign here to reference the variable gattung that's within the data set dd. Run that. We see that we've got 59 individuals of L, 49 of N, and 43 of OC. Uh, so there's quite a lot of individuals actually there for an ecological study like this. Um, and they're reasonably balanced across the different genera. Good. So that's the categorical variable. We know, we know a little bit about that now. Now let's look at the histograms of the two continuous variables. First, let's look at the response variable histogram. So we'll use ggplot of dd with as the aesthetics. x is gewicht. And please give us a histogram. Perfect. So we look at this and we see that it's quite a skewed distribution. Now this is often the case with the weights of things. So actually what, um, what we, so th this is probably going to cause a problem in the linear model. Um, not 100%, but probably. So we're gonna try and prevent that problem immediately by making a transformed variable of weight, evict, that is uh, log 10 transformed. I'm guessing that log 10 transformation is going to sort this out. Um, this kind of uh, skewed distribution can often be um, sorted out um, with a log transformation. So let's make um, a variable. Let's use mutate, the dplyr function mutate, to create a variable called log, a variable called log 10, evict. Now r is case sensitive, so I'll use a little g there. Perhaps I should use a big one just to be consistent with what it was up here. Um, make my life a little bit easier. Let me use the function log10 of gavict. Good, so now we have a new variable in the data set. We have a quick look at it. We've got a new variable that we added here with the mutate function log10 gavict. And 
let's copy this. We want to make a histogram of that new variable. This is a quick way to do it. Well, it's much better there. Let's just reduce the number of bins. So it's a bit gappy over. Over here, it's a bit gappy. So we'll reduce the number of bins. And you can see that it's probably going to clean this up a bit. Yes, it does It does a bit. Um, uh, maybe it's a bit bimodal, actually, with one um, a peak here and one peak here. Perhaps because this is one of the species, a small species, and this is um, uh, two, the two of the larger species. And that's all, all always a possibility. <clears throat> anyway, it looks much less skewed. So good. Let's have a look at the other variable. So weight would so just just going back. Weight is the response variable. That's going to go on the y-axis. That's what we're interested in predicting. And on the x-axis, the the other. Um, The other continuous variable is going to be the explanatory variable. Go on the x-axis is, uh, is this. And let's again reduce the number of bins. Would have been just as easy to type that. Um, reduce the number of bins. It looks pretty normally distributed. I'm pretty happy with that. So we'll continue without any transformation of that variable. The explanatory variable doesn't have to be normally distributed, but um, it uh, uh, sometimes we would, would want it to be so. Good. So we're happy with um, uh, the variables. Let's. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at the relationship and do a model of the relationship between uh, the circumference of this small part, Margenlumpf is the variable, and um, and weight. So let's actually look at the data, um, look at the relationship um, between those two variables in a graph before we even start doing a model. Of course, we should do that. So again, we'll do ggplot of dd aesthetics on the x-axis. We're going to have Margenlumpf variable. And on the y-axis, the weight. And please give us points. There we go. Uh -huh. So this is the um, the weight. It's actually the, not the log transformed weight. So it's kind of uh, it's a little bit curvy. This is, and also there's um, not so much spread in the vertical direction here but there is a lots of spread up here um, and that's um, that's a problem that's um, not that, that will mean that one of the assumptions of kind of equal spread across um, across the um, the data is not met so I forgot let's use log 10 of weight instead Oh, great. And so it looks much more linear here with equal spread across the range of the data. So they can see that, that what we've gained, most likely in terms of using that log transformation. We can also see that it looks like there's um, a, a very a very strong relationship. So we should be not at all surprised to find out um, um, by doing the model that there's a significant relationship. Um, we could try and figure out for ourselves what this uh, what the slope could be. It's a good idea to try and guess the slope from this. And I figured that there's about um, from from here from two to six. That's four units changing the x-axis. There's about I don't know one one and a half to one point two five units change in the y-axis, which would give a slope of about point uh, point three one. So let's write here slope guess of uh, 0.31 and also we should um, figure out a number of degrees of freedom that we expect to have of course um, we've got 143 observations and we're going to be doing a linear regression first um, and uh, so that would give us a um, number of degrees of freedom of uh, 142 because we're estimating two things in, in linear regression just the slope and the intercept 142 Good. Let's do that linear regression. None of this is particularly new for you. I'll call it M1 again because you've done linear regression before. Uh, so the response variable is Gewicht 
the explanatory variable is marginumph, the diameter of that small part, and the data is a dd. Run that. Now, of course, we do auto plot of the model to get those diagnostic plots. They just take a little while to make. Oh, you see, I've done it again. Well, it's good for teaching purposes that I forgot to use the log um, of the weight. I use the weight, and you can see here we've got this curvilinearity here, very strong curvy relationship between the residuals and the fitted values. Um, and also down here, this one kind of it, it increases. There's this increasing relationship. It goes down a bit, but then it increases. What this means is that the spread of the residuals increases as the fitted values increases. And you can kind of see that here. There's not much spread here. And then there's big spread here. Uh, so they're problems. Um, the normal QQ plot isn't too bad, actually, considering how skewed the data were. Um, and that's that's probably caused because we're not actually... Because um, uh, it's, the, it's the distribution of the residuals that we should be looking at. And we looked at the distribution of the actual data itself. Um, so, it, so you know, some of this isn't so good, but um, some of it is okay. Right, let's see what happens if instead we do what I meant to do, which is put the log 10 of weight as the response variable. And get the auto plots, get the diagnostic plots. Let's wait for those to come up. My computer's running a bit slowly at the moment for some reason. Here we go. Well, that looks much better. There's not a strong relationship here between the residuals and the fitted values um, in either of these cases. Well, the QQ plot could be better, but it's not too bad. Most of the data lies along the, along the line, so be reasonably happy with that. We've got one data point right out here, um, um, but um, we, so, so we could look at that if we wanted to, but I'm not too concerned by it at the moment. So just by doing that transformation, we've um, really helped with the modeling. Okay, let's get the summary of the linear regression. We have 141 degrees of freedom. That's what we thought we should have. Uh, we've got over 70% of the variability is explained. Uh, it's quite a good relationship. We expected that from just looking at the data. It was a pretty, pretty good um, uh, relationship between those two variables. Um, and the coefficients. So we've got an intercept, a negative intercept. Um, that's the um, that's the weight of the worm when the size of this small part is zero. So it's actually not particularly relevant. Um, and then uh, we have the slope. Uh, we guess 0.31. We got 0.32. So we got that very close. Um, and unsurprisingly, totally unsurprisingly, it's a very significant relationship. Good. So that's you know, that's the linear regression done. None of that's um, particularly um, new to you. Uh, perhaps we perhaps we could make a nice a nice graph just to communicate that result. Um, let's take the graph that we already made. This one and uh, let's think. What do we want to change about this? Let's make the axes labels a bit nicer. We do plus xlab, we'll call this gut circumference. Really also we should put in like a, a measurement unit. I'm gonna guess it was millimeters, I don't actually know for sure. And this would be um, worm weight. Let's call that in grams. Is that likely to be grams? Let's call it grams anyway. And plus, what else do we want to change? Um, there was one other thing. Oh, we, we should put a regression line on here. We can do that by what's called uh, putting a smooth smoother on. 
We want the smooth method, the method used to put a smoothing line on, to be LM, linear model. Let's run all of that. Perfect. Great. Um, quite a nice plot there. Um, you can see kind of the power of ggplot becomes a little bit more apparent and how easy it is to put that um, linear regression line on. Super. Um, that's enough for, for this video. I think we'll take a break. Um, in the next video of this series, we'll ask a question about whether the weight of worms differs among the genera. Okay, thank you.